Thank you both. This first one, this first one is for you, Siri. Yep. What's your advice for someone just starting to go to museums and look at paintings? Oh. Can you learn how to look? Well, that's a wonderful question. You know, the great thing about paintings is that a painting is there all at once. You know, it doesn't happen in sequence, but looking happens in sequence often. So if I really, when I really care about a p painting, I will stand in front of it, preferably sit. You know, there are not enough benches in museums. But, uh, you know, and if you crouch, the guards get nervous. This has uh, happened to me. But I will spend a couple of hours in front of a very interesting painting. And the painting really does begin to unfold. And you learn a lot about the peripheries of paintings. Uh, things begin to change. So yes, you can learn to look, but you have to take the time to look. Paul, do you have anything to add to that? No. <laughs> and this one is for you. OK. It says, uh, are you happy with what Brooklyn has become, or do you wish for the good old days? <laughs> Ah, why? I don't know. I mean, what are the good old days? The fifties when the Dodgers left, and the place was falling apart, and it became a, a, a crime-ridden borough, very dangerous, unhappy place, or the slow revival that started in the late sixties. Revival meaning people with a little money coming in and fixing up broken-down buildings that probably risk being demolished if, if this hadn't happened then. So I don't know. I mean, Brooklyn is um, a work in progress always. Um, it's become wealthier now, but there's still enormous pockets of poverty and violence. It's uh, almost 2.8 million people, I think, uh, which is probably as big as Paris in population. Um, it's too complex for me to say any one thing about it. No, uh, I don't like some of the, uh, uh, you know, the big money that's come in there. Yes, I like the fact that uh, one can walk the streets and not feel in danger. Um, and it's still one of the few places in the city where um, people raise families and feel happy to raise their kids there. So it's a mixed bag. It's gotten better. It's gotten worse but more better than worse, I think. Siri, do you want to add anything? I've lived in Brooklyn for a really long time, and uh, I, I remain a Brooklyn booster. <laughs> okay, this one is for both of you. Siri, why don't you go first? Okay. What's it like for each of you to have the other as first reader? It's good. <laughs> No, I, I, I mean, it, it's, it's good because uh, Paul is a, a very accomplished writer, as you all know, and uh, he has a great ear. And so it's been a real blessing having him as my, as my first reader. And uh, because I have him as my first reader, and I think because he has me as his first reader, um, not much is done to our manuscripts when they get to the publishing company. Nothing is done to our manuscripts. <laughs> Once they leave the house, they're done because we each have the other. And this one is uh, one of the most astute literary minds I've ever encountered. Therefore, um, if I give her and I show her everything, if she says, well, that sentence, maybe not. That adjective, maybe not. Even that paragraph, or maybe you've gone off track here. I pay very careful attention. And I don't think there's been a single instance in all these years when I haven't made changes when she has detected a problem with her uh, extraordinary inner Geiger counter about, about writing. Um, so, but the point is, I think that criticism of this sort is not valuable. We were talking to the high school kids about this yeah. earlier. Yeah. It's not valuable unless 
you believe in the person you're, you're, whose work you're reading and, and critiquing. Um, you have to be on their side. You have to want the project to be as good as it can be on the terms, on their terms, not your terms. I mean, I don't write like Siri, nor does she write like me, but I understand what she's trying to do most of the time, and therefore, if I have any criticisms, it's to push her in the direction of making it better on her terms, and I think she does that with me too, but that's essential. Just uh, uh, an astute literary mind is not enough. There has to be a kind of passion and compassion about the project of the other. This is a kind of follow-up, and it just asks, of you both, what do you most admire about the other's writing? Paul, you could go first. Uh, I've always been amazed. Uh, in, well, listen, Siri does lots of kinds of writing, so, but I'm talking about her fiction now. Um, how perceptive she is about small things, um, little exchanges between people, uh, you know, a small gesture. Um, the way someone's eyes will change as a certain emotion washes through that person. I think she's really great at it. And uh, it's something that I don't think I've ever been particularly good at or thought about as much as Siri has. And the intensity of the scrutiny is something that I've always been impressed by. But then when we get to the other kinds of writing, it's the enormous scope of her intellect and her knowledge and uh, the way... She can synthesize um, different fields and talk as a philosopher to neuroscientists and make them understand what she's talking about. And uh, I don't know of anybody else who's, who's capable of doing this. I've always loved Paul's narrative force. You know, I think that many of Paul's books have these potent narrative bones that drive you ahead. And it's extremely exciting uh, to be a reader of those books. I've also often thought that it is precisely these deep, often universal, if we dare use that word, uh, narratives about human beings that have made his books so beloved all over the world in very, very different cultures, uh, you know, from Turkey to Korea. So there's something about that that goes on in Ferguson that, uh, that I have profound admiration for. Last question. Siri, you take it first. It says, it's been, as you say, 33 years since you met here at the Y. Looking back, what do you think about the writers you were then and the writers you are now? For starters, do you still write poetry? When I met Paul, that was exactly it. I had published a few poems in literary magazines, and uh, I was working very hard to become a poet. I had always wanted to write prose fiction, but my... <laughs> adventures in that direction. I would, you know, write 10 pages and I had no idea where to go. So poetry seemed like a more confined business. I actually turned to, to prose at a moment um, when I was stuck. I said this to the high school students earlier. I got really stuck and a friend, poet and professor, David Shapiro, advised me to do automatic writing, which I did in prose because I don't know if automatic writing comes out in any other way. 30 pages were produced. I spent the next uh, three months editing them. And that, I thought, was the best thing I'd written up to that time. And I never wrote in lines after that. I have, however, written poems for characters in my novels. But they're not mine. They belong to them. I'm trying to think. Um, when we. Yeah, when we met, I, I, was, um, I was in the latter stages of finishing The Invention of Solitude, which is my first full-length prose book, nonfiction, nevertheless a prose book, and I too had spent my 20s as a poet. That's what I did 
And uh, I, too, had come to a wall with the poetry and then um, had had a breakthrough uh, a few years before I met Siri and was deep into this work. Uh, but I think the fact is she's been with me throughout the entire life of my uh, as, as a, my whole life as a novelist. Um, I finished the invention of solitude, and that's what gave me the courage to go back to fiction, which I'd been writing when I was very young and was very disappointed in and had abandoned, more or less. But then I took the plunge, and um, I was able to, to do it. And so, you know, it's been 16 novels, and you've lived through every one of them. And uh, I don't know, are we better writers? Yeah, we probably are better writers than we were then. We're certainly better. Um, <laughs> But uh, we, I hope to get even better than that. <laughs> so thanks for coming, all of you. It has been Thank great. You. Yeah. Thanks, thanks for coming. <laughs>